Go. You good? <laughs> what's up, YouTube? Uh, this is it's another. It's not YouTube. This goes on YouTube. He says, "What's up, podcast?" But this is YouTube. What's up, podcast? No, this is YouTube. What's up, YouTube? I'm not Chris. I can say it however I like. What's up, YouTube? This is another episode of Paradise on Fire. Uh, we're coming to you from quarantine here, back in beautiful, semi-snowy Canada. Um, we've been back from the Olympia and then Mexico, and now we're back here, so doing a little two-week quarantine stint. Um, so we thought it'd be a good idea to do a little, you know, couples or not couples or whatever questions you guys want to throw at us, uh, a little Q&A. So we got a ton of questions sent to Melissa's thing. I forged you guys there, and she got a bunch as well. So uh, we got a ton of questions. We'll try and kind of work through them here a little bit. Um, and answer as much as we can. Some will be fun, some will be a little more serious. So we'll start working through it. We got a couple of guests here. I don't know if you can see Bee's laying Yeah, Bee. Here. She Hi. says, oh, wake me up, you fucking asshole. I hate you. Oh, yeah. She says, that sucks. Um, yeah, I feel like it's been a, like a month since, I mean, the last podcast episode, I think it was us too, wasn't it? Before we went to Orlando. Yeah, so it's been five weeks basically. Yeah, so sorry you have to deal with us again. Damn <laughs> Christopher and Courtney are still in Chicago. My computer's going to die. Chris and Courtney are still in Chicago, so um, they'll be coming back probably at the end of the week, and then they have to start their quarantine. Um, so I'm sure we'll, you know, maybe try and get an episode with them before we're done ours and they start theirs, um, or after the fact, whatever. Uh, but yeah. They'll be on their way back soon. Should we talk about our peach? We should do our peach in our pit of Mexico. Really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we went to Mexico for Christmas after Orlando. That We being me, Ian, um, Courtney, and Christopher. Because if we were to come home after the Olympia, we'd come home to Canada and then we'd be quarantined for 14 days. So we'd basically be like locked in. In Christopher's tiny town, well, not tiny, I shouldn't say that, townhouse, um, and not really be able to celebrate Christmas. So we decided to go to an all inclusive in Mexico um, right after Orlando. And we were there for seven days, and it was so nice. And I'm mm. sad. I'm sad and I'm happy to be back. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Um, but my pit of the trip is that on like the second day I went swimming and my ear clogged and it literally cleared for the first time two days ago. So that's like 14 days of me having one. So yeah, initially we thought it was just she got water in her ear. Yeah. So I like did the whole like, you know, jump on one side and like tried to get it out and was like obsessively like shaking my earlobe and nothing was coming out. And then you just kind of think that you're going to like wake up one day and it's going to be clear. But it doesn't. And it never <laughs> cleared. And it was so bad because my balance was off. And I would go in the morning and I'd pick, up co- I'd pick up coffee. And it was almost like I had like no depth perception. So I'm pretty sure to... to... <laughs> you can see at at the bottom of the Can you? Yeah, just Do you need it. to say hi? Hi. Oh, no. Okay, now they're going to fight. Um, but I would go get coffee in the morning and two mornings in the, in a row, I was walking out and I hit the door and spilt all the coffee because I couldn't. Well, when your inner ear is all messed up, your equilibrium oh gets all thrown off. So. so uncomfortable. And then we flew home, which I'm sure didn't help with no. the pressure. And then we came home and it finally cleared. So now I'm like, I feel like everything's so loud. I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, it's nice. So I'm very thankful it cleared, but that was the only thing that really bothered me about our trip. Mm-hmm. Um, my peach was probably just being able to celebrate with you especially because Ian is not very um, he never really lets himself have a break from bodybuilding let's be serious even when it's like off season or Christmas or birthday it'll be like one meal and then it's right back on so it was actually really nice to connect and be with him for seven days straight and not really have the pressure of work we did work out but we didn't have the pressure to train he didn't necessarily feel the pressure to eat um we were able to drink and it was just really nice well i guess that's a good segue because that would be my peach as well i guess yeah i mean like not to steal yours i guess but yeah i mean for me you know, we've done vacations a bunch of times together. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if it's an off season when people be like, Oh, it's, you know, it's an off season and kind of relax, but me competing at the level I compete at, or even before I was a pro, I mean, I, I took my off seasons almost just as seriously as my competition prep. And 
for me to relax and like say, oh, I'm not going to eat my six meals a day or train or these kind of things was very difficult for me to let go from a mental perspective. Um, so even when I'd be on vacation, like, yeah, I could enjoy the beach, but then every two hours I have to eat. So like you're still controlled by the fundamentals that are within bodybuilding that kind of carry over onto the vacation. So, you know, I'd be worrying about my physique and worrying about training and the, and the food and stuff like that, where this time after being a very long season, um, you know, and capping off on a really high note with the Olympia, I think we did stop this too early. Hey, stop it. Um, you know, capping off a very high note with the Olympia. Helly, come here. Come. Come. Get up. Um, you know, and, and just feeling like a really good sense of fulfill fulfillment at the end of the season. You know, I felt like after all that and going straight on vacation from there, I was really able to kind of relax and, you know, put bodybuilding aside for a minute. Um, and it was just, yeah, definitely the most I felt, you know, connected to the universe outside of bodybuilding. Um, and really able to enjoy, you know, my time with Melissa and, you know, my time just to relax and recharge and like actually enjoy the atmosphere of where I am without the concerns of, of my bodybuilding life. So, um, and little to my like surprise, I got home and I didn't, my physique didn't fall apart. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes rust and stuff like that is really good for your physique, especially like, you know, I was prepping from January to January, basically, you know, mm -hmm. basically a full 11, half, 12 months this year. So I'm sure my body was definitely you know, excited to get a little bit of rest and a little bit of different food and stuff in it. So, um, but yeah, overall it was great. I don't really know if I have much of a hit to the vacation. Do I? Or what? No, I feel like you were like, you know, there was not really anything. Off. Yeah. I was yeah. just, you know, I was on a high from the Olympia, and, you know, really able to enjoy everything. So it's not really anything too negative to say, like, well, not that a pit has to be super negative, but no, but sometimes there just isn't a pit. That's okay. Yeah. I hope the dogs aren't too loud, but I can't control them. So yeah, Doug and Ellie are playing behind us here, so B doesn't want it. It's nonsense. She just wants to sleep here. Yeah, she's the best one. Yeah. This is why she's my favorite, and everybody <laughs> knows it. Come on, Uncle. Um, No, don't do that. Don't do that. Well, she'll sit then, at least. Um, okay, so how do you want to start? Um, just from the top. Yeah, so we're just going to – we're not going to do anything, like, too formal or, like, discuss any topics. We're just – we have so many freaking questions here, and it's – I find it's a little more like interactive with you guys to just get into the question. So we're just going to go dive right into these. You know, we could probably spend six hours just doing Q&A. So um, we'll just hop right into it. So How do you yeah. remind Ian he is a good bodybuilder when he has so much self-doubt? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I don't. I feel like I used to try so hard to like convince him of his ableness and like wanting him to see himself the way I see him and I think sometimes that will probably help someone and if I were to have a moment of self-doubt and he were to say that to me that would help me but I'm not I don't suffer from anxiety I'm not someone that like obsesses and the new word is ruminates over these like things that um bother me so I used to try really hard to convince him to kind of let it go and now I kind of just let him cycle through it yeah. and he's He's become more than ample at co like coping on his own. Um, plus, I mean, you haven't really had self doubt. No, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, I had small moments. You know, we had like a couple small moments in Orlando where it was yeah, like a few check momentary, in momentary lapses of it. Um, but I was, you know, I found myself much more able this time than in the past to be logical. Yeah, to not hyper focus on that one situation um and, and be a little you know bring a little more logic into it and be like okay this isn't you know what your mind is creating to, you know? to give some context like when he's talking about like situational things or like hyper focusing if you're taking photos in the same place in the same light and all of a sudden it changes ian's the type of person that sometimes he's not able to logically think this is different light this could be different this is why i might look worse or better, or whatever it is. I mean, before, I feel like he wasn't able to use, like, the logic part of his brain to think that way and be like, it's okay. Whereas this time, like, there was one photo that we took in different light, and you were like, what the fuck, why do I look like this? Mm -hmm. And you were almost like, it's different light. Like, yeah. you, you self-soothed. Where before, I would sit and, like, or another example of this is, you know, when I'll hyper focus on like certain body parts. And, yes. like, and you just know, stare at stare the chest. At, like, yeah, it's like, you know, for me, a big thing with me is like, like the fullness and, and the flatness of my chest is like a, 
as an indicator of where I am in terms of my level of fullness in the show. Um, but it almost gets to the point sometimes where I'll hyper focus and look at just my chest in a photo or in a video. And then I can't, I lose perspective of the whole rest of the physique and really how things are coming together as a whole. Um, and I look at one body part and the more you stare at one thing, that's all you see and you hyper focus on it. Um, and then you just, you know, you see nothing but that flaw. So, uh, for me to, you know, kind of snap myself out of those and, you know, look back at the whole picture of things and, you know, keep my mind steered down the path, um, you know, towards optimizing my physique was, was a lot more easy this time than it has been in the past for sure. Yeah. The advice that I would give to like wives or partners that are dealing with people like that is to not, um, don't like, don't try to like sh shut someone's feelings up. You know what I mean? Don't try to be like, oh, you're being crazy. You always think like this. Like, you you know you look good. Like, don't don't act like that because that's just frustrating. And I feel like I used to do that. And uh, just let people go through the process of feeling things and try to come back to the logic of the situation. And I don't know. That's really all I can say. Mm -hmm. um, Vegas or Florida for Olympia location. As a fan, this year's show was the best I have seen. Um, yeah, I mean, I loved Orlando. I, I like Florida. I'm not a huge fan of Vegas. I mean, I'm not like a club partier. I don't really see the intrigue with Vegas outside of that. Um, you know, I found Orlando a lot easier to get around places. You're not driving to the strip every time you have to go places. Um, you're not limited to just like strip hotels if you want to be close to stuff. You know, we got like a really nice Airbnb that was a huge house with a pool and full kitchen and everything. And, you know, had the ability to park in our driveway, not like park in, you know, in valet parking and then carry our groceries up, you know, an elevator, 10 stories and walk through a lobby with people that want to, you know, sit and chat and take pictures and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, so it was allowed us to kind of stay in our bubble and, and remain a lot more focused. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise in Vegas. So, you know, I, I, I definitely liked Orlando. I mean, obviously the venue limitations are going to be bigger. Um, in Orlando, I mean, like you have it in a convention center versus like a really nice theater, like they were going to have it in the Zappos this year, or even the Orleans theater the previous years are, are stadiums or theaters, right? Um, versus this year, the capacity was obviously a lot smaller because they had it in, uh, like, what was that? What do you call it? Like a big, it's like a conference center. Yeah. Like a big, like a, it's just a flat, a flat ground with a stage. Versus yeah, exactly. Like a, like a tiered a system. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, obviously, and the stage they made up for having a ridiculously beautiful stage and the show was run well and stuff like that, um, as it always is at the Olympia. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I do understand from a logistics and monetary point of view, you need to have a big audience. Obviously this year there was limitations, but going forward, I don't see them keeping in that same venue only for the fact that you can only have 2,000, you know, 3,000 fans at most kind of thing yeah. versus something like the Zappos or the Orleans, you can have five, 10, 15,000 people. So, um, you're just limiting a lot of your, your, the amount of money you can make from seating and ticket sales. So unless they're going to triple the price of tickets, which obviously no one wants, um, you need to be able to have the, the seating for, for enough fans to make it worthwhile. Right. So, um, but if they could find a place in the Florida area in Orlando that has that same kind of thing, I mean, I'd be all for it. I, I love being in Florida. The weather's obviously better than Orlando, especially this time of year. And I, I'm, from what I've heard, they're playing, especially for next year, to keep it November, December. Um, could be wrong. But, yeah, I mean, I liked it later in the year like that. I liked Orlando. Vegas is, like, expensive, too. Not, yeah. like, competitors, obviously, I feel like you figure it out. But, like, for people to come watch, like, it's a very expensive... Place yeah, because you're going to stay at, like, Aria or, like, you know, stay at, like... And you don't really want to visit Vegas multiple no, times. No, and you're, like, you, you know? got to air, you know, air, air uh, Uber everywhere through the Strip, sitting in traffic. It's Pay, just, like... Paying for parking. Yeah, paying for parking everywhere. It's just, like, it's, it's very expensive. So, I feel like it was nice that, I mean, not a lot of people could travel this year, so it's kind of sad, but Orlando is quite, like, an accessible place for people to come if mm -hmm. they want to. Um, I don't know. I like the idea of the Olympia moving year to year as it used to i think that's a lot of work logistically to like is, yeah. find venues every year but i feel like that's a cool idea mm -hmm. um i don't know cool. yeah. good question um how are ian's protein perks how have they been lately babe 
Well, those have been protein farts. Okay, like I'm just, uh, I'm not really much of like a protein farter from protein intake. I mean, I think this I, is from the broccoli for sure. Yeah, like at this point now, like I'm doing a detox diet, you know, post show and my vegetable and fruit intake and stuff like this. A lot of, you know, fibers and micronutrients and macronutrients that I might not have been getting in as much at other times. So it's kind of pushing everything out of me. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I handle high amounts of protein well. And, I really don't think protein farts should ever be a thing. I think usually when people are getting protein farts, it's because they're generally consuming a source that doesn't agree with them. So it's either like a, a low end whey protein, you know, whey protein concentrate or something with high lactose content or something like that that's not agreeing with them, as opposed to just protein making them fart. Um, you know, because I've I can consume five hundred grams of protein a day from you know chicken and and fish and lean beef and have absolutely no digestive distress at yeah, all. Yeah, basically but. your digestion's off if you're like that. Yeah, exactly. So that's... that would be a food sourcing issue. I actually got this question on my Q and A as well, so um, which I answered. But yeah, I mean, I generally I'm pretty good, but right now I'm having some broccoli farts. <laughs> they smell really bad. They smell really bad. Yeah, but he he doesn't normally smell bad. Um, as a competitor, was the December Olympia better, or was missing Thanksgiving food too sad? I mean, I... I think everyone liked it better. Anyone who follows me knows I don't give a shit about, like, food. Yeah, no, so. but let, let's, like, not just answer yeah, yeah. from our own perspective. Like, think about... I'm thinking just from the everyone. straight date, yes. From just a straight date perspective and, like, food aside, all this kind of stuff, the, the date does work better um, for a number of reasons. One, the closer you move it to if the Arnold was... Pretend, like, say the Arnold stays in March, which, as of this next year, it isn't, but... Um, I'm assuming they'll move it back to March. From a logistics standpoint as a competitor, having the Olympia in September and then the Arnold in March is a very difficult time frame. So if you've done, you know, shows throughout the season, say you competed May, June into September for the Olympia, um, there's not a lot of time to really like, you know, do a recovery phase, have any time to improve or anything into the Arnold. And then if you do the Arnold, now you're right in March and the whole season is starting in May to do an Olympia in September. So it makes it basically a full year thing. And you know, this I think is okay for someone that maybe competes in bikini or something like that. But um, when you're talking to the men's open guys um, or classic guys or stuff like that, I think it's not as ideal. So the, the, the closer you push the Olympia to the Arnold to close that gap so the season can start a little later and then it all kind of be crunched in together. So instead of being like March yeah, to but September. Yeah, what about the, from the other side then? Yeah, but now you have the uh, it done in March, uh, the Arnold, and then yeah. the season could start later. So then you you take your break after. Like, the Arnold would be the end of the season. Now. So then you wouldn't have the season, what, start till, like, July? June, July. Which this year, I mean, they don't have the first show is right now on well, the schedule. It's not, COVID, I know, but right now how it is on the schedule I find is optimal. Having the schedule start in, like, June or July and then go through December I think is more optimal. And having things crunched all in together a little closer. You know, the more shows you can do in a short period and then have more time off-season and downtime I think is better. You know, when you, when so you spread question, things out too much, then there's too, it's, it's yeah, hard to do yeah, everything. Yeah, question though, would you have the season, the qualifying season extend to November then? Well, yeah, and that's what they did this year. Yeah. Yeah, so they had it so up to that Europa show, um, which was whatever that was, end of October, November, mm -hmm. I can't remember, um, were all qualifiers. So yeah, you would have, you know, as many shows as you could late, you know, and then if you want to have, say, a post-Olympia season, you could have that after the Arnold then. And you could have that from March to June, and those would be qualifying you for the next year. I mean, there's a million ways you could do it. Yeah. Um, but I just think, at the end of the day, when you have an awkward gap, it's not long enough to be long. It's not short enough to be short, you know, like between September and March. Um, it's it not long it, enough to be beneficial. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's and it's not short, you know. That you can just continue your plan. That you can, you can just continue in. So I think uh, from that perspective... Uh, it would be nicer to have December and then you could really just, you know, kind of enjoy your Christmas for a couple of days and then just go right back onto prep to go into March. So I think that would be the most ideal. Yeah, I feel like it'd be nice to have the Olympia like late November, early December. I, I agree. Not as close to Christmas because I think that's hard for families and stuff. But um, yeah, I think um, having it like, yeah, first week of December or last week of November, like you said, would be, yeah. would be ideal, which I think they have toyed with that idea. How do you go about asking for each other's forgiveness? What does asking for forgiveness mean? Oh, oh if you screwed up and you need someone to forgive you. Yeah. I don't know. You say sorry. 
suck up your pride and say sorry. Yeah, I feel like you should, I mean, you shouldn't have any pride when you're in a, no. in a relationship. That's the I mean, I think it's, this is just a communication up. thing. You need to understand where you went wrong, where their feelings are impacted and why. Um, and then you need to create a, a template of, you know, how you can work on this together to move forward. Yeah. Do you know what's fascinating? I was listening to a podcast yesterday and they were talking about like the definition of power mm. and how it's very different typically from a masculine perspective versus a, like a, a female perspective. Sure. How like females are more like I can have, we can share the power. Whereas men are almost like only one person can be in power. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then when you're in a relationship, if you're like fighting for power in the relationship or pride, I feel like you'll never be able, you're never going to say I'm sorry or no. I'm wrong because then you're scared that you're going to lose your power. Yeah. So I, I, it's just interesting because I actually was like, you need to be able to rel relinquish yesterday. your power and not think of it like that. So you well, know you're also on the same team Yes. and you want your, you want your partner to feel powerful and you want to be empowered. Mm -hmm. There's like a way to do that together and it doesn't have to be like, you know, combative. Um, if you and Ian could change, I don't want to answer that. People always ask if we could change one thing about each other and like, we don't, there's nothing like, so what are we going to say? Um, why is figure the poor cousin to bikini when figure is the ep ep epitome, <laughs> epitome, <laughs> epitome? <laughs> epitome. <laughs> epitome of female bodybuilding? Okay. So why is it the what? Why is it the poor cousin to bikini when in, I guess in this person's opinion, it's the epitome of the female classes. I mean, I agree. It's the epitome of the female classes. I think it bridges the gap between muscularity and femininity better than any other class. I mean, once you start to go to physique and, and uh, bodybuilding, obviously there can be, I'm not saying for everyone, there's lots of beautiful, very feminine physique and bodybuilding women. Um, but there's more there, that but, aren't. Yes, in but those figure, than figure is the middle ground where you still have a good level of muscularity, but with still like some elegance and femininity, um, where bikini is more at the far ends of just the elegance and femininity with the low end of muscularity. Um, I don't think there's a reason for this other than that sexuality sells um, and that bikini is the most sexual. It brings the most beautiful to the average person physique to the stage. Um, you know, I think that's why something like classic physique right now is doing so well um, is that it's just a more attainable look than bodybuilding. And it's, you know, something that appeals more to the masses. You know, I think bodybuilding will always be the big ticket seller because people love to see freaks and abnormal things. Um, but from a, you know, like a appearance standpoint, I think the, the class of physique and the bikini are the most like, and like relating, right? Yeah, that's what like, I mean. Most relatable yeah. and attainable physiques. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like I said, sexuality sells. I mean, the bikini girls are, are the, you know, the essence that they bring off and the sassiness They're and sexuality. Hot as hell. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like no one's going to, you know, dispute that Janet Leigh is beautiful. She's and, gorgeous. You know, so yeah. I mean, this is, I think that's really where, what it comes down to, um, and I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, they don't quite understand muscularity on women at the same. So I think then that's why bikini is going to be a more relatable and sexual thing to everyone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would agree with that. I don't really know. I think a lot of this is also opinion because whoever asked this question is saying that figure is the epitome of female bodybuilding, but like. I some people might say bodybuilding. Exactly. So that's very, yeah. that's something that's an opinion. And I feel like the fact that there are all the classes is what's great. What the point what's, is. What's great about it. To have that variety and have the, you know. A spot for everybody. Yeah. Um, has sex drive ever been an issue when you felt uncomfortable with your weight? This is obviously directed to me. I was going to say for me. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm too heavy, I'm just like, I'm getting on the bottom. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Yes. I, yeah, but the thing is, the word sex drive, I guess that's your want to have sex. So, yeah, it it has been an issue. Um, I'm someone that's very hard on myself, especially when it comes to the size of my body. I think as I've been with Ian for longer, I've obviously become more comfortable at every stage um, of, I don't know, body fat that I'm in. I also 
recently basically got to the heaviest that I have ever been in my entire life. And, um, I mean, I stayed there for quite a bit of like half a year. Yeah. Eight months. You know what I mean? I was like sitting around 200 pounds and, uh, let's be serious. I'm not going to not have sex with my husband for eight months. So, I mean, we were having really good sex actually. So I feel like that's a journey that you have to take with yourself. And to be honest, I never really let myself actually sit and be uncomfortable in my body. Every time that I felt like I was fat, I would just all of a sudden start dieting again. I would never actually try to work through what issues go on with me and my self value and my self love when I do feel like I'm fat. So I think a lot of this comes from the partners end too. like for me, I want Melissa to always know that I found her sexy no matter what. Okay, she so no, to, to Ian has always accepted me no matter what I look like. He never tells me like the focus of compliments from Ian never are really about the size of my body. It's always you're you're beautiful just as I am. It's never like oh my god, your your butt is so tight right now. I love it. Like that would never come out of his mouth. It's it's just like oh my god, I love your butt all the time. So that that's one thing that I've never had to deal with because I have a very supportive husband who loves me at all sizes and shapes. But I think when you feel like your sex drive is low because of the size of your body, it's all internal. Of course, yeah. I don't think that's something that's external. I think that's something you need to handle internally. Mm-hmm. And um, 100%. I don't know. Just let yourself feel. And I mean, I talked to Ian a lot about it when I felt like that. And he was very understanding. He never made me feel bad about it. Um, and I, I think I would challenge you to just try to have sex and not think about your body. I mean, this really comes back to like the when you said about the bodybuilding thing and, and me and you telling me like, like, Oh, like, no, you look good. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's the same thing. Like, don't dismiss, don't it. dismiss the feelings. Cause I could say like, you're crazy. Like you look, you're you know, beautiful, you're I'm beautiful, not, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like it does, that's not going to change what they're feeling internally. Yeah. You know, like you can say that till you're blue in the face and it all it's going to do potentially is make it feel like their feelings are dismissed and that you don't take them seriously and stuff like that. So and you're disconnected. Yeah, so I mean, it's just, for me, it was just like to let her run her course, make her feel as sexy as I could, you know, um, and then, you know, things kind of sort themselves out over time, right? Yeah, I, you just have to learn to be comfortable in your own skin. Mm-hmm. And um, that doesn't mean that when I'm saying I was comfortable in my own skin in bed with my husband, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin at all. I learned to kind of remove that part of me from intimacy I don't really it's very hard to explain um but whoever asked this if you want to dm me I'll gladly voice note you and have conversations about this because it's it's kind of something that's really hard to explain um is it hard having your partner slash best friend critiquing you and your progress when in prep no do you think I have a hard time with that I feel like I haven't done a prep in a long time, but do you think I do? Uh, Sometimes. Well, I mean, for anyone you need to know, and I think this extends to coaching as a whole, um, I think you need to know your audience. Um, you know, and I think that motivation is different for everyone. Um, and how to critique. How right? to critique. And I mean, you know, I've heard people like, you know, Matt Jansen talks about this a lot and stuff. And, it, you know, you have to really individualize your critique. Um, and use those different methods to, to motivate, to, to, to drive people. You know, there's going to be the people that are, want to hear exactly what looks bad. And, you know, like the kind of people that are like, you look like fucking shit. You need to step your game up, blah, blah, blah. And there's people that you really need to be a little more gentle with. Um, you know, there's going to be different motivational factors for everyone. So um, it's really learning your audience and learning what makes them tick, um, you know, and, and using the right verbiage uh, to kind of steer them in the right course. So. You know, for someone like Chris, you know, I can be pretty hostile with Chris and how he looks, you know, like I, I'm not because he looks awesome most of the time. But I mean, I wouldn't hesitate to be like to Chris, be like, yo, what, we're fucking behind. Like we need to crank up the pressure here. Or someone like Melissa, I wouldn't necessarily speak in that way. And it's not because she's my wife. I just know that that's not necessarily going to be productive and, and motivating her to, to improve. Um, you know, so there's, there's different approaches you need to take from everyone. I don't think... 
I think we're both good at, even though we do have obviously a strong personal relationship, um, yeah, that we are good at separating critique from personal attacks. Like this is, we're very professional at what we do. Like we understand that there is, you know, a disconnect between these two and, you know, for anyone to hear critique sometimes can be difficult, especially when they feel the pressure's on. Um, but you know, I don't think we take it any more personal because of who it's coming from. No. And I think the longer that you compete in bodybuilding and that you are basically judged by your physique, the less personal that it starts to feel like it's, I don't think I'd ever be offended if someone was giving me uh, criticism about how I posed or about like my, my muscle imbalance. Like someone said the other day, your, your one quad looks so much worse than the other or some, or you look uneven. And like, that didn't even hurt my feelings. I was like, fuck, how am I going to fix that? Mm -hmm. It just becomes work basically. Um, and that doesn't change because he's my husband and he's my coach. If anything, Ian probably is a bit too easy on me sometimes because I'm his wife, but I mean, whatever, we figure it out. <laughs> Your favorite non-physical trait of Ian and his of you? Oh, this is too deep for me right now. You got one? Easy? Uh... I think Ian has a very um, innate ability to give people space to fully be themselves. And um, I don't know if I've ever met someone that's right off the bat and like ongoing has made me feel like I can be and say anything and just be me and that's enough. And I feel like he does that with a lot of people. And uh, I think it comes from him being very confident and secure in who he is as a man and I feel like that's that's something that like people say all the time but like I don't think I really see that in very many people as as I've like met more people for someone to be so convicted in who they are and to have that be so true that it actually pours out to the people that you're around so they people feel like they can actually be who they are and not be judged and be comfortable and be happy about it I feel like that's probably one of the most uh, I don't know. I don't want to say envious, but things that I value in you and think that I can learn from. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. I gotta think about this more. That's a tough. That's tough. He might not. I'm, be like, able I'm to, not good at that. He kind of might not be able to answer this on here. Yeah. Um. Okay. Now they're gonna think that I love you more than you. Love. <laughs> I think everybody knows that's not the case. Uh. Do you prefer Ian with his beard short or grown out? What's a short beard like, right now? Like this. This is short, yeah. I like it short. You don't like it when it's like big. No. It could be a bit bigger than now, but like... I just trimmed this. I like it close to the face. I don't like it like... Prickly. No, that's gross. Who said I love you first and when did you know you wanted to get married to Ian? I said it first. Yeah, Ian said it first. Um... You said, did you say it back? No, not right away. No, I said thank you. <laughs> and the, 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 the sweetest part about Ian is that... Oh, thank you. He kept saying it. Like, it wasn't like he said... She didn't say it, so I'm like, I'm going to stop yeah, saying it. I can't say it again. He wasn't saying it to hear it back. He was literally just saying it because he had to say it. And I, he kept saying it, and I would say thank you. And he would just... It was... You were so cute. But I also was very stubborn at the beginning, and I didn't... I loved him long before I told him that I did yeah. you know like I was I don't know I was emotionally, I was I was emotionally guarded I think it was also partly that I didn't feel like weird saying it not receiving it because I felt it because you knew I loved you yeah I mean whether you like felt the like that you could say it to me yeah because I knew you were guarded about it at, at the beginning um but I could feel that within you and in your actions and you know, how we were together, so I didn't necessarily need to hear it more as I felt it. So it was like, you know, it was kind of, it's what it was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is the best way to bring all my meals to a sleepover at a girl's house? I'm talking like 10 plus meals. Just bring them. That's really cute. Yeah. And I feel like if I was dating a bodybuilder and they came with their like fucking cooler and they were... <laughs> 
like was it is it a sleepover to a boyfriend girlfriend or to like a friend's? We're talking about like no, my, my girl, like my girlfriend. I'm oh, it's a guy. Sorry, it's a guy. And a sorry, girl. I thought it was a girl saying. No, I mean I think it's a guy. Yeah. yeah okay. Um. Well, I mean, I'm assuming if you're at the point where you're sleeping over each other, she knows that you're a bodybuilder in some capacity. So um, I think it from the beginning is the best time to really set expectations and s let them know who you are. Um, I think the biggest fault people do, especially at the beginning of the relationship, is setting false expectations and false realities of who they are. Um, you know, trying to be who they think the other person wants them to be instead of being themselves. Um, we've all done it, you know, to try and get someone's favor. You know, we all have kind of put on a bit of a an act or act like we don't do certain things. We do certain things more or less than we do. Um, so I think to just be a hundred percent yourself and, you know, eat when you need to eat and bring your meals around and just be unequivocally yourself is the absolute best way to find real happiness. And I mean, if this is going to be an issue, you might as well get it dealt with at the beginning. Um, you know, and then they know that this is who you are. And if it's going to be an issue, you can discuss it. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you this much about Ian and I, I feel like from the very first day that we met we were like unequivocally ourselves and I'm talking like maybe things that we were I don't want to say ashamed of but like things that you would not necessarily even put on the table it was all on the table right away and that has led to a very like prosperous trusting respectful relationship and there's no need for anyone to ever be anyone one other than themselves mm -hmm. you know like we just accepted everything and didn't try to change anybody or ourselves. And if you're doing that at the beginning, it's not probably conducive to like a long-term happy, genuine life, which like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Um, do you think top five in next year's Olympia is attainable for you? Is this for me or for you? It said top five question is for your hubby. Uh, it's difficult to answer. I mean, I think based off this year, it is potentially attainable. Um, I know that Olympia lineups aren't the exact same every year. I think if it was this exact same lineup next year, do I think I could move up two spots if I improve? Absolutely. You know, I think if I came in really good, could I potentially be Akeem or, or Bonac or something like that? Maybe, you know, Phil's not out in the lineup anymore. Um, yes. Um, but I also know there was guys that will be back that weren't there this year. And there'll be guys that were there this year that might not be there next year. Um, you know, like there's a lot of good guys that weren't there this year. So, you know, when you put Nathan back in the mix and maybe Flex is back or these kind of things, you know, the dynamic changes. Um, Roly. Yeah, Roly. Um, you know, so it, potentially, I mean, I'm not, that's not my goal for next year. As of right now, I don't have a, you know, it's not like I came seventh and all of a sudden I want to be fifth. I want to be third, you know. Um, my goals right now, because seventh was kind of a, kind of overshot my goals at the time. I'm not just going to shoot them over what I think is acceptable for but right now. Especially for placings and if you're a bodybuilder and especially for shows like the, the Olympia, Olympia yeah. I don't think you always have to place mm -hmm. higher every year no. for you to progress. That's no. not really... The Olympia is a little different in that capacity. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously I have show goals like I want to win Toronto this year, um, you know, which I think is very realistic. But the place at the Olympia is more secondary in terms of the, than the look, you know, I, I want to improve and there's things I want to improve and I want to see that dictated on the Olympia stage. Um, but like, I can't really say I want to place top five because it's, I don't know who's going to be there. I don't know what the, how the year is going to unfold. Um, you know, so that's, that's a difficult one to answer. I think to maybe answer your question with a different answer. Um, I think that placing top five in the Olympia is absolutely realistic at some point in my career, um, which has been kind of like my super goal in bodybuilding. Um, you know, after this year, obviously that goal felt a lot closer than I thought it would. Um, you know, at this point in my career, you know, I thought that it was kind of like an end of career goal where I'm two spots off that in my second Olympia. So maybe there needs to be a readjustment of goals, but I don't think that needs to happen yet in terms of my Olympia goals. I think right now it's just focusing on the look um, and progressing the look and, you know, some small goals of show winning things that I want to do um, and just keep going with that. And then, you know, say, I, you know, play six at this Olympia. Okay. Well then we'll say, you know, I'm consistently up in those placings. We'll reevaluate. But um, as of now, that's not a immediate goal of mine. No. Do you think a lot of people sometimes will like get um, like a glimpse of like the top and success and then all of a sudden start to like rush 
their their progression in their career? Well, I think I think people do this because they feel it from the outside, yes. you know. And I've already got this. I mean, since I played seventh, I've had thousands of comments and tags and DMs of people saying top five next year, top five next year. And I obviously appreciate their support. And anyone that's done that, this isn't like a knock on you. And I, I really appreciate your belief and your support in me. Um, but it's not, like we said, it's not necessarily a linear thing in terms of placing at the Olympia as it is in progression, like growth in your physique. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's tough to say. Yeah. Did the cabinet company resolve their fuck up for your kitchen? Yes. It started today. It started today, yeah. Um, biggest OCD you guys have personally or with each other? Biggest OCD. I don't really know what that means. Like obsessive, like thing that's like a compulsive thing. Mine is definitely you with your bottles and sing. But is that like a pet peeve or is that an OCD? Like, like obviously I, I have things like where I don't like the TV being an uneven volume, but like I thought everyone kind of doesn't like that. It's at 19, just put the fucking 20, it'll drive me insane. I have to have the bed made if the bed's not made. Yeah. Especially when I used to go to work and I would come home from work. But that stopped happening, but that would bother me because I don't like getting in an unmade bed. Um, I don't know. I don't really... We're pretty relaxed people, to be honest. I, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Our relax is probably pretty uptight to other people that yeah. When it's only you and Ian working out together, do you support him for heavier sets? Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't I? She doesn't just like chicken shit like, oh, I can't help you. Like, of course she does. I'm strong. I can put away his 100-pound dumbbells. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you guys also have to realize, me bench pressing 500 pounds, if I start to fail on that, I don't just go from lifting 500 pounds to zero pounds. I can still, like, once you start to fail, it's like, okay, you might be lifting 495, so she just needs to give a 5-pound assistance or 10-pound assistance, 20-pound assistance. You know, you're not just like... Oh, nothing, you know, and then she's got a deadlift 500 pounds up. You don't need an ogre to, to spot you, you know. Um, you know, you just need someone to keep it moving. And Melissa and I have a very good training dynamic in terms of pushing each other that's really got, you know, a lot better in the last, like, six months, year. Um, so, I mean, we I love training with Melissa, and, you know, we don't – yeah, she spots me for her heavy sets. They're my heavy sets. I spot her for hers. I mean, you know, it's – we do our thing, yeah. Would you rather eat only chicken and fish? Oh, sorry. Would you rather eat only chicken, fish, or steak for protein forever? So you can choose one. Well, fish fish is a, like, can I eat salmon and white fish? I guess. Well, then fish, 100%. I mean, even if I didn't have, if, even if I had to pick, like, one type of fish, I would still pick fish. Yeah. It, I mean, I think from a health perspective. Really yeah, from a health perspective, from... A digestibility from a state, like from a, a multitude of perspectives, I think fish is kind of your best answer. Um, especially if you can pit chicken, like white fish and salmon, like that's kind of a, you kind of get two with one there. Um, I think from a longevity standpoint, I don't think anyone should be eating beef that often. I feel like you um, get sick. And I think chicken that often, unless you're getting really, really, really good quality chicken, I probably wouldn't either. Um, but yeah, I mean, fish is a simple answer for me. I mean, how would you both deal with a difference in sex drive, i.e. one person is higher than the other? I mean, I'm the male body will have pump less drugs. <laughs> yeah, I can always have higher sex drive. I mean, you, like, there's not, it's not an issue, you know, I don't know. I mean, it would be an issue if it was extreme. Like, let's say you're a male bodybuilder and I'm at zero. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, like... No, I'm speaking to us. It's not an issue. I'm saying, yeah, I could see how it'd be an issue. Oh yeah, yeah, no, we don't. We don't have an issue with that. But um, I always tell women I get sex drive questions a lot because I think a lot of women have low to zero sex drives and they just live like that. I don't think that's normal. Um, so whether you need to like figure out your psyche or your relationship or your hormones or something, I think. I've had, I've had bouts where I've had very low sex drive and it, it, I wasn't healthy. I wasn't mentally healthy. My hormones were not uh, balanced. So I would just, I would question it. I wouldn't settle because everyone deserves to have good sex. Oh, whoa. Hmm. 
What does the sentence I love you mean to you, Bo? Is it just a small thing or is it three big words? <laughs> That's a deep question. I mean, both. This is interesting because I feel like we were talking to Dylan one day and he doesn't... Ian and I say I love you all the time. Like, I'll leave the house. I'll be like, I love you all. What, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, like, Dylan said that... Our, Dylan's Ian's best friend. He lives with us. He was saying that he doesn't say it all the time because then he thinks the meaning gets, like, watered Demetrius. down. Yeah. But I think if you mean it, then you should say it all the time. I don't think there's, like, hmm, let's just save it for special occasions. You know <laughs> what I mean? Um, it's the frilly, lacy undergarments. <laughs> save it for the date nights. But, listen, I say I love you to people that I love. I love. Um... And that's, I say it a lot. Like, I'll say it to Christopher, I'll say it to Courtney, I say it to my mom, I say it to my dad all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't, um... It doesn't lose any meaning. Yeah. I, she could say it to me a hundred times a day and it doesn't mean any less to me. I mean, you know, and I think... I think you should say it often, to be honest. Yeah, and it's one of those things that this almost sounds a little dark, but, like, you never know when it's going to be your last time seeing someone kind of thing, you know? Like, so I think to always let someone know how much care and admiration you have for them and to let them know that they're loved is always important. So um, I think you should say it as often as you can without sounding like a fucking drone, you know? Um, who is the more sensitive one? Ooh. That's really hard. I feel like it's tough. so equal. Equal, but in different ways, yeah. <sighs> Probably me. By a small margin, but maybe as of late, more you. But this is the thing. If I, you asked a year ago, it would you, have been me. Yeah. But then I'd say I've got less sensitive, um, mm -hmm. and you've stayed about the same. So I think you might be a little more now. But listen, we've both grown a lot over the last year, and I think, um, I think, me pre like my, I don't know, pre Arnold. Yeah, pre my mental <laughs> breakdown was very. Um, Like, riding, okay. like, on Posting. top of the surface. Skimming, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know if I actually was um, feeling everything. I was very, like, going through motions in life and just kind of, I don't know. I wasn't, it wasn't like I was a robot and I didn't have a personality or anything like that. But I think I've started to feel a lot more and to be a lot more introspective over mm -hmm. the last year. And I think it's caused a lot of different emotions to come up. And, um... Some of that is sensitivity and me being mm -hmm. emo more emotional. Um, Ian, on the other hand, has done a lot of growth in the last eight months, whatever, in terms of his ability to process, I feel like, his emotions. So now he's become almost more, I don't know, functional? Yeah. That sounds bad. But... More functional. <laughs> I can be a proper... Get member of society, functioning member of society now. <laughs> so I feel like we've now like met each other in this middle yeah. ground of like, I think you have to be sensitive to feel the good emotions too. So I don't think there's anything bad about being sensitive. And I feel like we're both sensitive people and we both, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I really want to talk about this. It's asking if we're getting the COVID vaccine. Hmm. No, we'll leave the politics out of this. Yeah, we don't give a shit. No, we don't. We, we, don't, don't, we don't do that stuff. We don't talk about <laughs> that. Um, oh. What are the things Ian has broken being so big? Uh, I read it so dirty at first. I was like, <laughs> oh! <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, oh, my couple stools like uh like for the bar like counter two or three of those at least yeah really just chairs and it's mostly from him leaning on leaning our back on last chairs. mattress i had broken oh my god he broke he he broke in a prop what was that four thousand dollar mattress it was a very expensive king's down mattress in, in fact, four years it was broken for two years yeah so it, was, it took years. him two years I, uh, and we had rotated it mm-hmm so I had a crater in it that was like this from my weight, like my shoulder weight being on it, <laughs> sleeping in it. Um, and it was just like a very good quality mattress. And I had just like collapsed all the internals of it. So, But we got a new one and it's really nice. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom. 
Um, what is your first show, or is it a secret? Well, I already said, mine will be Toronto, probably. I mean, maybe Vancouver right before it, but uh, probably Toronto. And Melissa's going to aim for something earlier than that. But I've decided to um, just get ready and do the to do it a show when I'm ready. And the goal is to be ready in June, like early June, which is when I think the season will probably start. I yeah. can't see the season starting any earlier. Um, but I just want to compete as much as I can because I feel, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do this for. And um, I've really missed it. Like it's, it's something that when like going to Ian's athletes meetings and going to these shows, it's not, I don't miss anything other than actually just doing it. So I really just want to do it as much as I can this year. Um, cause I don't know how much longer I'm going to get to do it for, which leads to the next question. When are you guys considering having a kid? Surprise. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like... May of 2023. Yeah, every time that you try to plan your life, it doesn't fucking yeah. go to plan anyways. But, like, there is obviously a biological clock for women, so soon-ish. But, um... Soon-ish, but not too soon. Yeah, yeah I want to be done yeah. competing. And I don't know if I'll compete after, but there's probably a high chance that I won't. So I want to be done and settled before... I actually, um, it, we actually start on that next well, journey as parents. When are the gyms going to reopen in Canada? We don't know. Will we get a tour of the new kitchen? Of course. You'll get plenty because I'm going to show it off mm -hmm. all, all We're gonna the flex, time. We're going to flex it on your left right Flexing second. hard. How do you guys resolve conflict? Communication. When... It's Chris's Olympia video coming out. Not sure. DM Calvin. Calvin, you're taking too long. <laughs> Soon. I check YouTube for it every day because I'm a narcissist and want to see myself in it. <laughs> How many times do you do sex? Two times. How many times do we do it? Two times. Just two. <laughs> Maybe one. It doesn't even say like have sex per a week. week just, month, no. just... How many times do you do sex? I mean, in our whole life? I don't know. Should we try and calculate this? Are you joking? <laughs> You could not. You could do the math approximation. Then people could work it out for themselves. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Is Ian French or why can he speak French? Why can't I? Why can he? Who says I can speak French? Ian cannot speak French at all. Pitié, he he can pitié, understand pitié, it. Totally but, pitié pour le français, oui. Yeah, but that's a lie. No, I don't really speak French. People I mean, who speak English, especially people that live in... Ontario. Uh, Ontario. All they need to know how to say is un petit peu, and then everyone <laughs> they can, thinks they, they can speak French. French. I mean, most of us, it, it, especially in Canada, like, you learn French in elementary school up to beginning of high school, and for the rest of high school, if you continue to do it. Um, French is like your second language you learn in high school. Like in the States, you might have Spanish. In Canada, it's, it's French. So most Canadians know some French. So if you want to pretend to be French, you certainly could. Um, I have a very French last name. Um, I don't say it like super French. Uh, that's my dad's, obviously my father's father. Uh, so my, my grandfather was very French. Um, you know, like he, French was his first language. He didn't speak, you know, fluent English until later in his life. Um, but that kind of ended there. Like my, my dad's mom was very English. Uh, my dad doesn't speak any, my dad speaks less French than I do. Um, maybe his sisters probably speak a little French, but yeah, it kind of ended with my, my dad's generation and, you know, I know a little bit that I learned through school and, you know, one of my best friends is French and I pick up here things here and there, but uh, I am by no means French now. Next vacation you want to take as a couple? You want to answer that? Or? When do we get to go? <laughs> That's not the question. You yeah. go tomorrow. What's the answer? Uh, I really want to, I, I mean, I really, really want to go to Aspen. But, yeah. like, but that's also, I've missed, I've literally missed winter over the last three weeks. I'm Canadian. I like, in the winter, I like the snow. So I really, really want you, to go to It's Aspen. not even, yeah, you like, like, the coziness. Yeah. You like, like, fireplace it's and cute. cozy and, like, nice snowfall and, you know, that kind of stuff. There's obviously, like, for Canadians, 
you know, any Canadian that, like, especially grew up in, like, eastern Canada where there's a lot more snow, there's going to be a huge nostalgia factor to, like, winter and Christmas season, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, somewhere like that would be nice. Aspen looks so nice, too. Yeah. Um, listen, I feel like there's obviously cooler places we want to go to, but I don't even really think about going anywhere far right now because, like... We've done enough fucking quarantines. Yeah, you know, and... I mean, I guess we'd have to quarantine for what's past. No, but, but we also travel so much for shows that the idea yeah. of doing, like, a trip to Greece or a trip to Italy or a trip to fucking Australia, if it's not, like, for a show, it just feels like too much effort yeah. at this point. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of sad, but it's true. Um, where has Chris been? Well, he was with us in Orlando. He was with us in Mexico, and now he's in Chicago. He's in Chicago. So we left. We left Mexico. Melissa and I flew home to Canada, and now we're doing our two-week quarantine. Uh, and Chris flew with Courtney to Chicago. They're staying there for a bit to do their Christmas with Courtney's family and all that kind of stuff, and for her to get Poppy, her dog, uh, and they'll be returning to Canada. Any story? Does Ian think he has a shot at winning the O? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. That's not, that's not something that's at a goal for me. I mean, it's not, you know, if I do, it, it's going to, what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm not going to set that as a goal for me. So, uh, no, to answer that question, I don't, I don't believe that's a, a thing that I should set my goals to attain. Probably a stupid question, but are you related to Chris? I don't know how I don't <laughs> know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Melissa is Chris's older sister. I am married to Melissa, so that's Chris makes Chris my brother-in-law. So Ian, married to Melissa, Melissa, sisters with Chris, Chris dating Courtney. That's the dynamic. So I, and because a million people ask this, I met Melissa first. So I didn't meet Chris and then start dating his sister. Chris is five years younger than Melissa and I. So when I met Melissa, Chris was in high school and I was, you know, three years out of high school already. He was in grade 11 and I was three years out of high school. Uh, Melissa and I actually went to high school together, but we were very separate social circles. So we didn't know each other in high school. Um, you know, we knew of each other, but we probably never had a conversation or hung out or anything like that. Um, but we had a mutual friend, um, Ashley, who has been a friend of mine since even before you. Yeah, I didn't meet Ashley until yeah, I was 16. Until 16, but I'd known her since I was like 12, 13. Um, and then after high school, Ashley and Melissa had kind of reconnected and were hanging out more. And Ashley was actually living with me at the time. Um, and that kind of brought Melissa and I together and then we started hanging out and the rest is history. And then, then I met Chris through Melissa. Chris was already a little bit into weightlifting, but like I said, he was in grade 11. Um, and then as I competed, then we kind of all got into that dynamic together and they started competing and stuff like that. So, yeah. What's your trick to keep normal? People have a lot of sex questions mm. and this is because of you. Yeah. Sorry. Because you're a pig. <laughs> <laughs> What's your trick to keep normal sex life with your partner after PED for years. This is a guy asking this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously your desire is going to be lower after being like at a high high from a, you know, androgen sex drive, you know, hormone perspective. So even when you come down, your testosterone is normal. It's always going to feel blunted compared to where it was. Um, so, you know, first thing is obviously making sure that if you're not in the normal range, that you get so. So if you've been doing it for years and you need TRT or HRT or something like that, that you're doing so, um, or you know some kind of post-cycle therapy to make sure that you're getting your hormones back really as, as much as possible. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of other things that can correlate to this as well. Like you know, lipid levels and you know, cholesterol levels can impact your sex drive a lot. Um, so bodybuilders that use like lots of Anivar and stuff like that that might have depressed HDL and stuff like that can um, definitely have you know an impacted sex drive. So these are going to be things that you need to check out. Um, from a personal perspective, you know, it's, you want to take that one? I don't, I don't know. Oh. I've never had that issue with you, so I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know. Go get some Cialis. <laughs> no, that's not the answer. I mean, I think this is just a communication that needs to, to happen here. I mean, you know, if your partner is worried that the less sex is because of a less attraction. You obviously need to have the, the discussion um, and just make sure you guys are on the same page. I think that's really the most important thing to all of this is as long as everyone is understanding and everyone is okay with the situation, I think that's the most important part of it. 
Um, you know, I also if, think there's like if there's any sort of like shame around it, mm -hmm. um, speak about it. Mm -hmm. Say, I'm. I mean, something that's really powerful to say when you're trying to talk to your partner and you're scared too is that like I'm nervous to talk about this with you, but I need we need to talk about it, mm -hmm. and that. I guarantee you guards go down and the space is open and clear for you to speak where mm -hmm. it should be. Um, and if you feel any sort of like shame or awkwardness around something, that's probably a sign that it actually needs to be spoken about. Yes. And the hard conversations are not important ones. Yeah. yeah. I guarantee you these, these conversations that you don't want to have and that you're nervous for and that you'll think about and convince yourself not to have. Those are the most important conversations to have as a couple for your relationship to grow and to prosper and um, just be brave basically. Mm -hmm. Why didn't Sebum wink at you on stage? I don't, I don't know. know. Why didn't you, Chris? That was rude. I actually was very surprised. Yeah, but we were also standing like... I don't think he could see... Well, we were standing way over at the far side. Like, he wouldn't be able to see. No, but for prejudging, Oh, sorry, prejudging. That wasn't it for prejudging. I, I don't know if he could see me. I swear he could hear me because I was saying, like, flex your glutes, and then all of a sudden his glute would flex. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if he could actually locate me in the crowd, which last year he could. And... Uh, for everyone saying the screaming, it was me. Like, it yeah, you could hear Courtney screaming, but what through the live stream and anything that was Melissa, you could hear screaming, not Courtney. I get, I, I get offended when I don't get credit. For that. <laughs> I, screeching. I, I, lo I lost my goddamn voice for that. Um, Melissa, how is it for you to see the two people you care about most achieve great success? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Fuckers. <laughs> Fuck them. Uh, no, honestly, it's uh, like you're, uh, you always want that for people that you love. I mean, for everybody, you really want everyone to feel good. But when it actually happens and it happened for both of them, it was really, I mean, first it was relieving uh, for sure because you don't want to see people sad. But then it was just surreal. Like it, it was very euphoric after. Um, the weekend it was it's it's special okay do you want more dogs yeah always i always want more dogs who ate more tacos and who had more drinks in mexico you probably ate more tacos no i mean i didn't eat a ton of tacos are you just using this like as like a term of like who ate more food uh, I probably ate the most food and consumed the more, most booze. So. I probably ate the most tacos, though. Yeah, actual all, tacos. That's all I ordered. Chris, no, Chris probably ate the most tacos. You Chris so? only eats tacos. Yeah. Chris, anything Chris eats, he gets it, and then he gets tacos, or what do you call those things? Quesadillas? No, the, the little ones. What? Tosada? Oh, is that all called tacos? Burrito? Yeah, burritos them. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, there gets like the little ones like in tacos them or burritos, like everything he eats. You know, he just mashes everything together and then rolls it up in burritos and tacos. So that's what he did. I didn't eat a ton of tacos and burritos and stuff like that. I mean, I that's not like really my thing. Uh, but I, I certainly ate the most food and I certainly consumed the most alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Ian was a lot of fun. Uh, how often do you mess with each other? Big love 2021 is for both All of you. day, every day. <laughs> it never ends. That's probably That's true. true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, current split. Right now? I mean, right now because we're not, we're on quarantine. It's really nothing. Uh, but before that, I was doing a kind of a modified. So I was doing chest and triceps, back and biceps. Quads. What was I doing? Shoulders and chest. Back and hamstrings. Mm -hmm. So just to simplify, I was hitting back twice a week, chest twice a week, arms once, legs once. Um, and the reason being, obviously, I want to improve my chest and my back the most. So I was giving them the most attention, get, trying to get blood in there the most often, um, which I think worked. Uh, 
you know, I think they both looked the best they had by a long shot at the Olympia. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the approach that we took for there. Um, the volume was a little lower. Like when I'm saying I would do chest, uh, like shoulders and chest, um, I would do like my main shoulder workout and then I might do like two chest exercises, you know, like some blood work. Like I might do, you know, five sets of pec flies with a 45 second break. So I'm to like really force some blood in there. Um, and the same thing, like on my hamstring day, I would do back again. I wouldn't do like six back exercises. I would do like, you know, maybe a giant set or two or three exercises kind of thing of two or three sets, like, you know, six to eight or six to seven working sets at most. Um, that's kind of how I would do it. So I mean, people want to know your answer to that too. I do whatever he does, <laughs> except for chest. She doesn't, and arms. she doesn't train chest and arms really. I force her to do some arm stuff here and there. Um, but she'll also do more glute, like glute specific work that I'll do. Um, and she trains shoulders more than I do. I don't really need to train a ton of shoulders. Um, and I don't, tell I don't need to train a lot of glutes. So, um, you know, I do some glute work, obviously with my hamstring work, my quad work, squatting and leg pressing and stuff. Um, but I also don't, you know, train shoulders two or three times a week like she would. Yeah. Sometimes like I'll do a glute day with Courtney when he does a chest day or I'll just hit my shoulders again. But I really am focusing on everything from the back. Mm -hmm. So hamstrings, glutes, back, lower back, um, and just detail and thickness. So I don't really think I need to grow my quads. I still train legs like a motherfucker because mm -hmm. that's just like what you do. Oh, like, that's fine. Yeah, I feel like you can't not train legs like that. Um, and I do think that I lost significant mm -hmm. tissue. So, um, But it's come back to that some, that's for sure. Yeah. So I've, I've been training everything really heavy and really hard. But I'll always focus mostly on back and... Um, glutes and hamstrings because that's like a very mm -hmm. one-dimensional part of my body um when did i know that you were the one babe i don't know when did you i mean i feel like there was a time in march the first march that we were together which we'd only been together for four, four months five months four or five months when, uh, I mean, my family had a rough time, my nanny died, um, I went through something health-wise, and uh, we were young, we were like 22, 23? 22. 22. Like, young kids, he's just a boy, basically, and he was like, probably the most supportive, like, rock I think I'd ever experienced in my life. And uh, I saw a lot of uh, characteristics in him at that time in my life that I see and value in my own dad. And I think, honestly, at that time, I was very sure that this was someone that I would want to be with for the rest of my life. But I don't know if, you, if I ever really was like, there's ever like that moment of like, he's the one. He's the one. But that during that it's an evolution. No, during that time was definitely, and I was still young, but I just remember thinking like, this is what it means to actually have a man that loves you basically and supports you mm -hmm. and respects you and values you. And Lord knows the the person that I was with before didn't do any of that. So I think it was a realization of like, wow, this is what it's actually supposed to be like, and this could be good basically um i feel like that's like i mean there's like how to bulk properly but like mm -hmm. i we can't answer that yeah. hire a coach do you prefer going to sleep early before finishing all your meals or finish them even if late i mean i would <laughs> always finish all my meals I mean, this is my life. I've stayed up till three, four, or five o'clock in the morning finishing meals. I think, I mean, people are going to have different perspectives on this. There's going to be people that are going to think that the recovery is more optimal. I disagree with that. I would rather get two hours less sleep and get all my food in. I think over a long period of time, the calories will be the most important. Um, but I mean, it's, yeah, it depends on you. I mean, I'm also speaking from someone that doesn't have to get up to go to work in the morning. So 
you know, I don't have to get up at 6 a.m. to go to a job for 7 or 8 a.m. I mean, I can sleep till 9 if I need or 10 if I need. I mean, you know, this is my life. So if I can just stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning to get my food, it's not going to, like, throw off my whole, you know, day. And if I'm tired the next morning, it's not like I'm going to be, you know, have to work an eight-hour work day tired. Um, but I always think that you should. The thing is, in my opinion, the harder decision is going to be to get up and eat the food. So I think that's the one you should do. You know, it's easier to get up and go to bed because that's the one we want to justify in our mind as being better. But the reason you're trying to justify that in your mind is because it's not better. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, are you, are you working towards a goal and what is that goal and how are you going to get there and just base your I, actions? I think that the vast majority of the growth I've been able to attain by my age has been by consistency and perseverance with food. Um, obviously a lot of this will be, you know, hard training and stuff like this, you know, which unequivocally obviously will yield a lot of growth, but I think the consistency, like I could count on one hand, how many meals I miss in an off season over a five year period, you know, I mean, like it's very, very minimal, you know, even the days I fall asleep on the couch, wake up late, you know, I always get the food in. I always make sure it's there. Um, you know, especially if your goal is to be like on the big, big end of bodybuilding, um, you know, those meals are pertinent. So I think that's something you should absolutely be, you know, focused on getting in. When you were feeling down and lost, what helped you start to train again hard? Lots for you. Um, I just... It, it sucked at the beginning. I didn't want to go at the beginning. Um, I just got really tired of myself. I could tell my husband was tired of me. Um, and I just kept thinking about the alternative of never starting. Um, so basically days started turning into weeks, started turning into months, and it almost came to a year and I hadn't gone to the gym. And uh, I, th I just was at the point where I was like, okay, you're either going to be this person that doesn't work out and is overweight and doesn't like herself or her body, or you're going to suck it up for however long it takes to get back in there and get back in shape. And um, it was really shitty at the beginning. I didn't want to go. I didn't really train that hard. I just went. Um, I wore Ian's clothes. Um, and then, like, slowly, I started recognizing that when I would eat better, I would feel better. And that would lead to me feeling better in the gym. I think a lot of it that we help, you used to help get you motivated as well, was putting an emphasis on getting strong. You know, yeah. I think this was something that, you yeah. know, because you aren't necessarily going to see like the physique that you love right off the bat, yeah. um, that could take six months or a year. I think you need to set some kind of goals and something that could get you excited about training. Um, so like people, you know, will get hyper focused on scale or things like this, which I think can drive you insane. I think the better way to do it and how I think was kind of subconsciously or consciously for Melissa was that it was like okay, like, you know, we're getting stronger on the shoulder press, so let's push the heavier weights. Let's try and do the 50s this week, 60s this week, you know? Well, um, let's be serious. It actually started with 25s. Yeah, but I'm saying up to now, you know? Yeah, um, but I, I also think, like, at, and I think at the beginning is when people will go for a week and then they'll stop. Mm -hmm. And they'll go for a week and a half and then they'll stop. And I'm, I'm not lying to you when the first four to six weeks of me back in the gym was dreadful. I was shoulder pressing 25 pounds, which is lighter than what I do for lateral raises now. I was so weak and I was so sore. I felt so swollen and like crunchy and just like Just disgusting. like your energy, your cardio sucks in the gym. Disgusting. And it was so bad. And I just kept going. And there was a point where I would, I wouldn't go home after work. I would just drive to the gym and sometimes I'd sit in the car for fucking 30 minutes before I could like actually go in there and work out. And for the first little bit, just going was enough for me. Whether I did five exercises, whether I just walked on the treadmill, just like going every day, that was enough. And as Ian said, I started focusing, and it was very subconscious, but it also probably comes from my history of training. I started getting stronger, and that started exciting me. 
I started being like, oh, I can do this this week, and last week I couldn't, and that started exciting me. And um, I didn't really care about how my body was changing. No, because at that point, think about at that it. point, it's you know you knew what was happening, but you know you knew that it was going to happen in the time that it happened. It was more about my mental states of me feeling strong and healthy again, mm-hmm. and that took a lot of pressure off results. And then the results started to come, and that started to be a motivating factor. Um, I went to a show with Ian in New York that really fired me up. As soon as I came back from New York and was training with Ian, I was, I was a different animal in the gym. It was just different. Um, but it took time. It took a lot of time and I had to give myself a lot of grace to not be perfect every day, but to keep showing up anyways. And I would challenge you to just start showing up. And it doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to look amazing and you don't have to train hard every day. Um, it's really, it's easy for me now to like post my like intense leg press but videos. Like you said, just getting there is like, as said, sometimes is 90% of the battle. Mm-hmm. You know, just getting there. Once you start getting moving, you know, stuff like that, you'll usually feel better and, and will be more prone to get in it. But even if you don't, just getting there and feeling that you're capable of it and moving um, you know, and getting a little closer to your goal is always going to do good for your mindset, which then is going to do more for your physique and your progress. You yeah. Know? And you also need to build a habit and you need to understand that sometimes at the beginning, there's this like discipline that needs to take over for the habit to build. Oh, yeah. Um, That's good. yeah, just start and just show up. Mm-hmm. That's all. Um, Okay, this will be the last one. Okay. How did you guys meet? Explain how the first dates went. Mad respect to you both. Why well, are kind of explain it the first time? So you, yeah. can, you can do it from the beginning. Then. We met through Ashley. Um, Who, as I said before, was a school friend. Well, actually, listen, technically we met through Brittany. Because I didn't actually have a conversation with Ian... Ian picked us up from Ashley's one night and drove us to the bar. Yeah, you but that's, that's me and through Ashley because I wouldn't have been there. If it, I guess, but Ashley. I didn't speak to you that night. No, that's true. And then uh, I had gotten out of a relationship, so I started... So, well, yeah, this was before Ashley was living with me then. Yes, Ashley lived at uh, like a... In a town, or a A condo. cute little apartment near... Oh. In Canada. And um, I was in a relationship at the time. The relationship ended... And we at, were at the outset of the relationship. Yes. And at that point, when the relationship ended, I think Ashley was living with you. Then she had been. Because she was there. sleeping over at my parents' house a lot with me around that time. And um, I started going out more because obviously you're single and you're trying to socialize and be... Keep busy. Yeah, yeah feel better. Um, and there's one night after work that I really didn't want to go out. I was like, oh, it's Friday night. I finish work at 10 o'clock and I work at 8.30 the next day. Like, I really don't want to go out. And my girlfriend, Brittany, was like, come on, I'll meet you at, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll meet you at the bus stop. I'll pick you up at the bus stop because I work downtown, so I would always bus back and forth. Um, and I'll drive you and it'll be great. Like, Ian and his buddies are there. And I don't even know, Spencer and, like, yeah. I don't know, like, a group of guys that I didn't know at all, but Brittany really wanted to go. I think maybe because she had a crush on Ian. Um, but so she picked me up, we went to O'Connor's and I was just like standing around and I met Ian. We like shook hands. It was like, nice to meet you. And I wasn't drinking cause I worked at eight 30 and, um, I was drinking. Either. I don't even know what happened. I think Ian went to the bar and came back and like gave me a beer and I was like, Oh, I'm not drinking. And he was, he, or no, you offered to buy me a drink. I'm like, Oh, I'm not drinking. And you're like, now you're drinking. Then he went and bought me a beer and gave me it, and uh, I liked get it. Him, get him liquored up, you know? I didn't even get drunk. Mm-hmm. I, I, but I liked the assertiveness I, a lot, and then when we were driving home, uh, Brittany was going to drive me. She's like, I'll drive her, don't worry. And he was like, no, no, I can drive her. I'm going this way anyways. And Brittany was like, no, like I want to drive her. It's fine. And Ian was like, very, I want to drive her. So then I was like, okay, fine. And I remember he made all three of his friends sit in the back seat. So there's like three big guys in the back seat and I'm in the front seat with Ian and he drove me home. And, uh, I couldn't tell if he liked me at all. He was like very like stoic. 
stoic, like didn't compliment me. Like he, he was polite, but like, it wasn't like obvious. And he dropped me off and Brittany had actually followed us home and she was sitting in the car. And afterwards I got out, she was like, come tell me how it was. Tell me how it was. And then I got in her car and we were like sitting in the front seat, just chatting before I went into my parents' house. And I was like, I think I'm going to text Ian to say thank you for driving me home. And Brittany was actually like, okay, I'll text him and say thank you for you. And I was like, no, give me his number. I'll text him myself. So then I texted Ian and I said, hey, it's Melissa. Thank you so much for the ride. Smiley face. And then I knew I had her. Ian says at, with the emoji, yeah. he's like, I knew I had her. <laughs> and then that's how that happened. And then from the then, first date we went on, we went out to lunch. Oh, I really didn't. We went on a lunch this. date to. Well, why was it lunch though? There was a reason for this. No, we were doing. You were doing so. After that, Ian started texting me every day. Good morning. How was your day? How was work? What are you doing today? Blah, blah, blah. Every day. And at that point, I was like, okay, this guy probably is interested in me. Um, we started hanging out a lot because Ashley lived there, obviously. And <laughs> <laughs> you're so cute, baby. Uh, we didn't really get a lot of alone time, though, because my best friend lived with him. So, like, it was always the three of us. So, every time Ian had to do, like, an errand or, like, whatever you'd come with he'd ask me to go with him so we'd drive and like be alone together and stuff like that and um we were doing an errand one day and i i didn't want to go on a date i was like i felt awkward about it i feel mm -hmm. i was like a nervous little girl like i didn't really want to do any of that and he he didn't really want like he liked going out to eat he was like can i take you out to eat can i take you out to eat and finally, one day, I was like, okay, we can go to lunch after we go to the grocery store, whatever we were doing. So then we went on a lunch date to Moxie's, and I don't even think... Did I eat? No, I think you had a drink, and that was Yeah, I don't even think I ate, because I was a fucking idiot at that point. Now I look back, I'm like, why didn't you eat? Free food. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was our first date, and uh, yeah, that was... We hung out almost every day after that, I feel. For a while, yeah. Anytime I could. Yeah, he uh, he was very, uh, very assertive, and I think I really liked that. Cool. The genesis of Ian and Melissa. Yeah, we'll have to tell the story of our first kiss another time. Yeah, we could tell it. That's a, that's Someone a, asked that next time we do this. Someone actually did ask that. Someone and they also asked. See. They also asked how our first night yes. was. Oh my <laughs> god. Look at these two. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice. This is the end of the podcast. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, hopefully next week we'll be back with Christopher and Courtney. Um, yeah, they'll be in quarantine, but we can do it like outside our house and them at theirs. Yeah. Day. And then um, maybe when our kitchen is done, we can do it an episode in the new kitchen. Yeah, that'll be fun. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your question. Peace out, YouTube.